This is the first living quarters for the station. Once launched, it will automatically dock with two other station components already in orbit. Svezda allows crews to stay and live on board permanently for the first time. The successful launch of Svezda marks the start of a cascade of space flights, which launch from both Russia and the United States to bring more station parts into Earth orbit. For the last two years, missions to the station average about one per month. It is an unprecedented level of activity. Can you see the station? Yeah. Wow, Steve, did you see this? Oh no, not since we came up. Well, you gotta come and see this, bud. Getting the hardware into space is only part of the challenge. A piece at a time the station must be put together in Earth orbit by people. The station evolves considerably from the beginning of its assembly in 1998. With each mission building upon the success of the previous flight, the station sees the addition of components providing power, air, communication, living accommodations, and a laboratory for scientific work. The architecture of the station also becomes more evident as parts of its 350-foot support truss are added a section at a time. Actually building the station in space involves a combination of techniques. Robots built by Canada move the giant station pieces into place. Both the shuttle robot and the station's Canadon too have proven to be invaluable in the assembly of the outpost. Okay, the downing handles are removed. You can cover the waste ring. Okay, the drake valve position is good. To complete the assembly tasks, astronauts don spacesuits and put the high-tech station parts together the old-fashioned way, by hand. The marked increase of spacewalks has been referred to as the Wall of EVAs, which so far has exceeded over 250 hours and is continually growing. At first, astronauts conduct spacewalks on the station exclusively through a docked space shuttle. This changes toward the end of phase two of station assembly when astronauts Jim Riley and Mike Gernhardt help install the station's own airlock called Quest, a new gateway into space. Coming out of the station is different than coming out of the payload bay in the orbiter. Uh, when you come out of the airlock in the orbiter, you have the payload bay and the structure of the vehicle all around you. Uh, coming out of the station, however, you're looking straight down 220 miles down to the surface of the Earth. As Mike described it during the EVA, he described it as, as skydiving 220 miles. You really do get this sense of, of nothing between you and, and the ground. For the astronauts who journey to the station and for the station's crew, there is a safety net a support team on the ground that keeps a watchful eye on every system, every operation, and every detail with the utmost care and attention. Since the beginning of space travel, this has been the job of mission control. From their various consoles, these highly skilled professionals send commands to the station, adjusting and monitoring station systems around the clock. When astronauts experience unforeseen technical glitches or malfunctions, ground support springs into action to find a solution to the problem, enabling mission success. The station era requires mission control to think beyond the fast-paced two-week shuttle missions they were accustomed to. Space Station has taught us we're, we're learning that transition to routine operations, trying to ensure permanency in space now, and I really do think we're there. This is a marathon and not a sprint. As the station constantly grows and changes, 
Control centers around the world step up to share the responsibility to support both hardware and crews. The Russians know far more about their segment than we ever will. Canada, Canadians know far more about Canada Arm 2 than we ever will. So it is more complex. At the same time, there's a greater depth of knowledge out there that you get from dealing directly with the people who built all these arms. The work of ground support allows crews living on board the station to concentrate on their primary objective to conduct science in the microgravity of space. Scientific research on the space station truly begins with the arrival of the space laboratory, Destiny. With the interior room of a bus, Destiny can accommodate over 20 scientific racks Weighing more than a thousand pounds on Earth, the science racks are guided through the station corridors by fingertip movements until finding their home inside the lab. Just as successful construction of the station is a major event for engineers, the arrival of the science racks marks a major milestone for scientists. Well, it was, it was a a quite a tremendous moment. Of course, before we got our racks up there, we had done a few experiments, onesies, twosies here, because we had some resources available. And I kind of think of those as the appetizers before you sit down to a, a gourmet meal. And certainly when the racks got up there, the entrees got served, and we were all sitting down to a feast. Investigators take advantage of the unique environment of space to study fundamental principles of physics, chemistry, and biology. And the station's permanent location in orbit allows more detailed studies over time. We've done a lot of research in the past on the space shuttle where we're limited to about two weeks. There are many chemical and physical reactions and human reactions that we would like to watch for a much longer period of time to see how they play out. We just can't do this in short flights. So on a space station, you can pick the time period you want and continue an experiment for a very long period of time. In Huntsville, Alabama, at the Marshall Space Flight Center, investigators send commands and monitor experiments. The data retrieved can be applied to some very down-to-earth disciplines, from pharmaceuticals to manufacturing, to exploration, and even commercial endeavors. Back on the station, crews conduct research outside of lab racks as well through a special window in the Destiny Lab designed for Earth studies. Here, middle school students can become scientists too through EarthCam, a small remote controlled camera mounted at the Destiny window, which allows student investigators to photograph our world, posting the results on the internet for public viewing and use. Finally, the station crew members themselves are also part of scientific investigations, as sites are set on future long-term missions to the Moon and Mars. Researchers look for crucial information regarding the effects of space on the human body. Humans permanently living on the station begins in October of 2000 with the arrival of Expedition 1, consisting of U.S. Commander Bill Shepard and two Russian cosmonauts, flight engineer Sergei Krikalev and Soyuz commander Yuri Gidzenko. The crew carried out the important task of bringing the growing outpost to life. During their stay, important traditions were also established. Permission granted, Endeavour departing. Three-person crews continue the mission of exploration rotating in four to six month increments. Despite leaving family and friends behind, Expedition 2 flight engineer Susan Helms found day-to-day -day living in space to have some unexpected benefits. We had lots of things we could turn our attention to any hour of the day, and we often did that. In fact, we often gave up weekends to do extra data tapes for science for example, we liked being busy. Now, it was easy to be busy because you're not distracted up there by the noise of life. There's no cable TV, there's no internet, there's no phone mail or beepers or cell phones up there in space. 
we didn't have any of that. And actually being on space was the most stress-free six months of my life as a 